Hello, thanks for joining us today for how to take better native plant and flower photos. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to welcome any of you who are new to the California Native Plant Society and tell you a little bit about our organization and our favorite topic, native plants. California's native plants are what make California look like California, from the Joshua tree of the Mojave to the redwood forests of the North Coast. We're lucky to live in one of the most botanically rich places on earth with more types of native plants than any other state in the US. At the California Native Plant Society, we think that's something worth celebrating and protecting, and we invite you to join us. CMPS is a nonprofit organization with more than 10,000 members, 35 local chapters, and a team of staff. Together, we work together to conserve wildlands, protect endangered species, can collect scientific data and restore nature to our home and public landscapes one garden at a time. We're the voice for plants and plants need us now more than ever as we face the challenges of climate change, extinction and growing development pressure. But we need them too. None of us, not the insects, the birds nor humans can exist without them. So when we save plants, we save everything else. If you're inspired by what you see and hear today, please consider getting involved. Become a member by visiting cmps.org forward slash join or sign up to receive our emails and learn more about what we're doing at cnps.org forward slash get connected. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, the people who are behind this presentation, um, starting with Ed, who's our tech host. And Ed will drop in if something bad happens to us. Hi, Ed. And then I'm going to introduce Katie. Katie is going to take care of the Q&A. So please look down at the bottom of your screen and see find the Q&A box. And it's where you should put your question. And Katie will collect all your questions and, um, and pose them to Erin at the end. And, um, and now I'm going to introduce Erin Eccles. Erin is our chapter conservation chair. Um, he has won the Cal Flora photo contest um, with a great picture of Romnia. Everyone thinks they have a great picture of Romnia, but Aaron actually does. And, um, and he's, a, he's a local photographer, a professional ecologist, and a botanist. And, um, and he has made uh, uh, taking pictures a lot easier for me. And we hope to share that with you today. So um, welcome, Aaron. You are on mute. Thank you. Oh, okay. Oh, one more. I'm just going to cut in with one more quick. Our plant sale is online this year. And if you have questions about that, we'll answer it at the end of the presentation. So go, Erin. All right. Well, let me go ahead and share my screen here. And um, please do interrupt if I, uh, if my sound becomes distorted at any point, and I, I might have to um take that measure to uh to fix that if need be all right here so i assume everybody can see that is my screen being uh, shared adequately? We can see it. Looks beautiful. Okay, perfect. So let's uh, let's go ahead and get started then. So this is uh, how to take better native plant and flower photos. And um, do note that's that's a better. That's not the best. Um, if you want to take the best photos, that's probably a different class, and I'm not the one to teach it. Uh, so this is just. Uh, how to how to improve your photography with uh, respect to native plants uh, slightly. So I'll just share some of the the tips um, that I have and some of the the things that I do uh, to to get cleaner, uh, kind of more appealing plant photos. And I uh, I feel like I might well Orchid you did a pretty good uh, job of introducing me so um, I'll pass on the uh, the introduction. <clears throat> I was hoping to, uh, at some point this past year or even during 2020, do a field trip where we were going to do uh, some photography 
related visits to, to different areas. And, you know, obviously with the state of the world, that didn't happen, but uh, potentially in the future, there'll be a, a time to go into the field with people. And um, it's, th this is a topic I think is much, uh, it's much better to, to teach in the field. Um, so look forward to that. Maybe <laughs> we'll see how 2022 looks, uh, or at least like the, the spring of uh, 2022. So uh, let me see if I can get my slides to work. Is that working? No, space bar. All right, we'll go with the mouse. Uh, so why do you wanna take uh, better plant photos or better wildflower photos? Um, I'm sure there's people here for, for different reasons. Um, maybe you wanna have something that you're proud of. You wanna uh, create something to, uh, to share. Um, maybe you want something that's uh, post-worthy. Maybe you wanna win a photo contest. Um, the majority of my photos I actually take to upload to uh, either CalFlora or iNaturalist uh, as a, a way to upload a, a plant observation point. So it's a photo tied to a GPS point, tied to whatever information I decide to um, attribute into that observation. Um, probably most of the photos I actually take are for iNaturalist or for uh, CalFlora. But then, uh, you know, every now and then I'm, I'm struck with uh, you know, an, an artistic moment and I'll, I'll try and, you know, spend a little bit more time and, uh, with the plant and, and do something creative. And, uh, we'll go over actually both of those things, um, during this presentation. So how to take, uh, you know, more appealing, uh, photos in, in general, um, you know, something that you, something that's a bit more than a snapshot, if you will. Uh, and then also how to take good reference photos for sites like iNaturalist. There's, there are kind of two different goals there. Um, when you're uploading a, a plant uh, photo for uh, for INAT or for CalFlora, you want to um, do a few things different to make sure that the you know the somebody else can ID the plant, or that you and and uh, after you get back home can ID the plant properly. Uh, and so, uh, where to get native uh, plant and, and wildflower photos? So the first step, I, obviously, is you have to find the uh, the flowers, uh, you know, if you don't know where there are, if you don't know where to go and you don't know where to find flowers, you're not going to be able to uh, get photos of, of uh, those flowers. So um, this is, I think, an easy step. Essentially, you just got to get yourself outside. Um, there's no lack of areas in the San Bernardino Riverside area to go to, you know, in terms of uh, parks. Uh, we have the, the San Bernardino Mountains right near us. The Gavilan Hills is a great place the you know you can get out to the desert and um you know I, i'm sure everybody remembers the uh the poppy massacre of, of 2019 in walker canyon near lake elsinore uh that that was a fantastic place to be if you were trying to um to try and take wildflower photos um i will say also that uh you know something that i use is uh, all the, there's uh, the theodore Payne foundation has a, a wildflower hotline and then also DesertUSA.com. They, they both have wildflower reports. Um, they're really active during the spring. You know, obviously there's not much going on now in the, the middle of summer, um, at least in our area. Uh, but those are good resources. You can, you can check uh, again those, those two um, and uh, see where different things are blooming, uh, how good the bloom is, you know, what the quality is. Um, these two uh, areas, are one of one of these is the the photo on the left is Santa Rosa Island actually during a really good bloom year and then the photo on the right is uh, is in uh, Lytle Creek if uh, people are familiar with that section of the San Gabriel Mountains. Uh, the other spot uh, that I tend to find myself uh, magnetating towards are, are fires. Um, fires are. Well, not, not fires themselves, but you know, f fires after they've happened. Um, you don't want to go there while the area is burning. But <laughs> when a fire has occurred, visiting the, the burn area the year after or even a couple of years after, um, that's, that's a great way to find some really amazing uh, flower displays um, and even some new interesting plants that you don't see very often. Uh, we were doing some surveys in the uh, San Bernardino Mountains our CMPS chapter. And I think for the first time we got a photo of a, uh, a, a pretty rare Senecio species that's up there. Uh, I wasn't able to find a pre-existing photo. All there was was photos of herbarium specimens. So um, uh, good good uh, fires are, or burns, I should say, are good places to find um, 
you know, potentially uh, flowers that have never even been photographed before. Um, and when, so you, you don't, you need to know where to go, but you also need to know uh, when to go. Um, and uh, here I have a bunch of the infamous uh, Calicorda species. There's a, a community of botanists that, botanists and photographers that every year, um, you know, come around May or June when it's Mariposa season, uh, they'll get together and, and just, you know, start traveling across the state and coordinating on, you know, where to find and, and um, how to find different uh, Mariposa lilies. Um, and so when, when is actually an, an important question, because if you do want to photograph, for example, one of these Mariposa lilies, if you go out, you know, in early April, you're probably not going to find any, you know, they're, they're hardly leafed out at that point. So knowing something about the actual plant that you want to photograph uh, definitely helps when it comes to finding it. Um, there's obviously not a ton going on uh, right now. This might be a bad time of year to do a presentation like this. Uh, but, you know, even, even here in, in the peak of summer, uh, there's still, you know, you can go out and you can find the California fuchsia. Some of the uh, stephanomerias are blooming right now. Um, Malacothrix, uh, Sexatilis is blooming. So there, there's a few things that are out there. Um, and you can always go up in elevation uh, as well, right? So um, San Gregonio Peak right now, it's at, uh, above 11,000 feet. Uh, that's, it's kind of prime uh, bloom season uh, right now in August up there, just because it's at such high elevation. So, um, you know, timing uh, is, is certainly a factor here. Something that I actually use uh, quite a lot, uh, a resource that I'll share with you, is Calflora. I'm sure many people here uh, know of Calflora, um, but you can type in any plant name uh, into their search database, uh, or you can just do a general search and uh, click on you know a particular species, and it gives you this really great. Um, let's see if I can get this pen to work. Uh, a really great map of the you know where the plant occurs, and you can actually click on one of these counties and get a little bit more specific. This is a rare plant, so some of the points might be obscured or, or some of them might not be very accurate. Uh, but this is a good way to find uh, where particular plants are uh, or have been. That uh, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to still be there. Uh, and, and then this is a, a great little uh, pie chart right here that shows its average bloom period. Um, you'll definitely find uh, that, that there's a little bit of a give on either side of this highlighted range. Um, you know, occasionally you'll find in this case, the, the species in bloom in April, um, but more or less, uh, you're looking at uh, May, June, July, if you want to see plumber's mariposa lily in flower. So Calflora, an awesome, uh, awesome resource. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't only want to know the right season and the location um, to, to go out after your flowers, but you want to uh, pick an appropriate time of day um, to photograph them if that is indeed what you're doing. Um, so I don't want to go too much into general photography rules and you know photography concepts um, too much, but the the golden hour or that that period of time uh, after sunrise, about an hour after sunrise and before sunset, about an hour before sunset. Uh, that's when you get that really magic light. Again, those two times of day are known in the, the world of photography as the golden hour. That's when you want to take the majority of your photos. Um, if you're going for something dramatic like this, um, this is a desert lily uh, just out in the middle of nowhere um, with some dramatic clouds. There's actually a rainstorm uh, happening and then the sun kind of peaked out, um, peaked out beyond the, uh, from behind the clouds um, at the horizon during the last moment. Um, so, the golden hour is certainly the, the best time to get dramatic uh, flower photos, but it's, it, you know, it, it definitely depends. Uh, if you're going to be uh, in the redwood forest, for example, uh, maybe you don't want to be out an hour after uh, sunrise there. Uh, it's just going to be too dark. Uh, maybe you know something about that redwood forest. Um, for example, the fog breaks at uh, 10 a.m., around 10 a.m. every day. Well, then you kind of want to be there when that fog's breaking at 10 a.m. Or similarly, if you're you know, up in the San Bernardino Mountains and you're hiking around in a, a black oak woodland and it's a pretty dense canopy, perhaps you want to wait till the sun is directly above you in the sky. Maybe 12 noon is the best time to go take photos in that situation. That way the sunlight 
is diffusing through the tree canopy and it's giving you kind of the best diffused light um, in the, for the understory. So it's, uh, it, it's contextual, I, I guess, more or less. Um, I have a note here, many flowers, uh, especially if you're trying to photograph poppies or, um, or you know, some other kind of common flower, many flowers uh, are actually closed in the early morning or around sunset, which makes using the, the golden hour to get your photos um, almost useless. You're gonna, yeah, I've, I remember I learned this the hard way. I, I went to the poppy preserve in a little valley thinking I was gonna get some incredible sunset photos and all the, uh, all the poppies were just closed up. And it, it just wasn't the, it wasn't what I was looking for. Uh, and you don't only have to go out during the day. Uh, you can take flower photos at night even. Uh, I guess I was, uh, I was feeling really creative when I tried to capture this morning glory with the Milky Way. Um, but uh, there, there are some species like this in the corner here, this uh, night blooming Linanthus um, that grows out in the desert. There's actually three species of, of this uh, Linanthus um, that'll, uh, only open at the in the late evening and then they stay open for the entire night. So if you want to get a good photo of them open, um, you'll you'll probably have to go walking around with a headlamp on. Um, in this case, I, I was in some lava fields uh, on the Mojave Preserve. Uh, and I, I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, but weather is is definitely important. So I'm looking out of my window today. Uh, great overcast skies, um, maybe a little bit too overcast. Uh, but that's generally going to be the best uh, light uh, if you want to capture uh, flower photos. Um, you've got the, the sun kind of diffusing through the clouds and it, what it does is it lights everything evenly. So you can see this lupin photo right here. Um, there's no harsh shadows. It's kind of evenly lit. The background is in balance with the, the foreground subject. Um, and you can compare that with this uh, columbine here just taken in full sun and kind of harsh light. Um, and it's very contrasty. The, you know, I've got all this, all this bright distracting stuff in the background. Um, the stamens uh, and stigma are actually in a shadow. So they're kind of darker. And then there's these highlights here. It's just, a, it's very contrasty. And um, here, you know, the, the subject is not isolated. It's just overall um, kind of a bad, a, a bad look. Um, so that's, um, again, there, there's exceptions to these rules, so um, as we'll see in, a, in further slides. Um, but here's, a, here's another example of uh, this uh, blue dicks over here that was taken in full sunlight. Um, you'll notice that the, the background is just a lot more brighter than the actual subject, and, and what it does is it draws your eye away from the subject. And um, generally speaking, um, when you're trying to create a compelling image, you want the viewer's eye to settle on the subject. Um, and in this case, it's your, your eye just kind of wanders. There's all this brightness in the back. Compare that with the image on the right. Um, maybe a tad underexposed, but I, I kind of like it. Um, I took this in, in an understory. Um, Ludix doesn't usually grow in an understory, but in this case it was. Uh, and uh, you know, you can see the darker background and then the subject is the brightest thing in the photo. Um, and the lighting is, is, is evenly lit. So um, the difference between using, uh, you know, harsh sunlight versus nice diffused light. Um, you could also create this photo on the right by taking, a, you know, an umbrella or some kind of diffuser, um, you know, just a big giant shade screen out and then shading your, your plant. And then um, you can kind of create the same effect if you don't like the harsh light. Uh, that said, um, I actually take a lot of my photos in um, sunlight. Um, there's, you, you can definitely finesse it. Um, there's, there's no, just because you have a blue sky day, uh, so to speak, doesn't mean you can't come away with some really uh, good photos or, you know, some good dramatic clouds in the sky. It might not be overcast, but maybe you've got some, some drama in the sky. And so, um, again, the, the Poppy Massacre of 2019 here at Walker Canyon, um, for this photo, I had some great clouds and I actually, I like the contrast. I like that the, the clouds were casting scattered shadows across the hills. Um, and then this photo on the right, this is a humble lily. Um, again, a pretty blue sky day, uh, but I, I found that I could set that lily up against the sky and then it gave me, um, you know, kind of a nice background. And I actually used a flash for this to light the flowers from the underside. Uh, but 
yeah, just because you have a blue sky doesn't doesn't mean um, you should just stay home. Uh, definitely go out and, and still try and get flower photos. Um, here's another image um, that I, I actually like quite a lot. And again, this is just, um, I didn't really have a, an overcast sky. This was just a, a blue sky day, uh, but still able to, um, to get a, a pretty nice uh, image of this uh, mountain dandelion. Uh, so with the kind of when and where uh, out of the way, uh, we can go to the the how. And so this is a, this is where all the hot tips come in. Um, so if if there are still people in the audience, um, I think this is where you'll you'll learn something. Uh, or maybe not. We'll see. Uh, but this is uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm gonna go over kind of some some technical aspects to taking photos and just really what to what to pay attention to. Uh, and I, uh, I will start with equipment because um, that is important. Uh, but a few of the things that I, I'm going to touch are uh, equipment, composition, uh, light, background, which is, uh, in my view, maybe the most important thing to pay attention to. As strange as that sounds, you're like, well, what about the subject? Uh, isn't that the most important? Eh. You know, we'll, we'll see. We'll take a look at some sample images. Um, depth of field is important, and we, we can go over what exactly that is what that means. Um, and then you, you want to have interest in your photos. Um, you know, I said that a lot of the pictures that I've presented so far, they're not erodium in my backyard. They're not garden weeds. Um, you, you really do want to find, um, you know, compelling subjects. Um, and you also want to find, uh, you know, good looking subjects. So uh, when, when we get to interest, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this, but, um, to just mention it now, when I'm walking through, uh, or when, when I'm on a hike and I, I'm uh, looking for flowers to take photos of, I don't just snap a photo of the first flower I see. I really um, take a lot of time and I wait to find the right one. I'm, I'm looking for the perfect flower. I'm looking for something that's nice and isolated. Maybe it's you know grown near a stream if that's what I'm into. Um, I'm looking for one that's perfect. You know, it hasn't had its um, leaves or its petals chewed out by some insect unless that's also what you're looking for. You know, sometimes that can be interesting, um, but I, I'm really looking for a kind of the, the perfect specimen uh, when I'm out. So um, again, we'll, we'll get to interest, but um, to, to just state it at the front end here, um, you really do want to be selective. If you want to get a, a really good looking uh, flower photo, you want to be selective, find the right flower, make sure it's perfect, um, make sure it's uh, the one that you want. Don't just go for the you know, the first flower that you see. Uh, and then scale is important too. You know, it, are you going to zoom in uh, with a five time macro lens or are you going to, um, you want to represent the scene uh, at, at more of a landscape scale? Uh, and then this is, uh, I just, these are just random photos that I threw in, but this is a closed up cream, cream cups. Um, so this is a, a flower that actually opens up um, later in the day, but I, I find it interesting uh, to photograph when it when it's closed because it just it looks like these little balloons uh, and I, I actually like photographing this plant more when it's closed um, and just uh, touching on light real quick since we're here um, this is a sunrise photo so that the sun is just coming up and it's kind of casting this this nice golden uh, light onto the scene and it's kind of giving it uh, you know a bit of a dreamy look I'm also using a really shallow depth of field here so Almost nothing is in focus, you know, except for the one thing that uh, that I'm I'm trying to draw your eye to. Uh, so a, a lot of people do ask me about my camera equipment. Uh, you don't obviously need to have all these things, but I will just um, mention these things uh, in the event that they're interesting. Uh, I did this presentation a few years back, and it, in in polling the audience, most people didn't have a camera; they just used their phone. Um, so I, a lot of the things I'm about to talk about apply to a phone also, but just some of the things that you can do with the camera, you can't do with a phone. Um, so unfortunately, um, you're, that you're just going to be limited in, in, in that way, but uh, a, a lot of the concepts still apply. Uh, but here's what I use. Um, I really like this red camera uh, over here. Um, I actually use this, believe it, I have all this, this camera gear, all this junk, it weighs like five pounds in my backpack. Honestly, 90% of the time I'm using this red camera. I can just strap it into my shoulder pouch on my backpack when I'm hiking around. And it's really easy to access. And it's, um, it's an Olympus TG Tough 
camera. It's not made to do macro photos, uh, but it, it takes really amazing macro photos. You can get really, really close to your plants. Um, you know, you can almost capture the pollen grains on the anthers of the plant sometimes with this camera. Um, and I, I do find myself using it most of the time just because it's, it's the easiest thing to use and, and it does pretty good, especially for iNaturalist. I use this camera a lot. Um, if I'm trying to, again, get, get real artsy with it or, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm creative uh, or, or something, I'll, I'll jump to, you know, one of my full frame macro cameras uh, or full frame cameras with a macro lens, I should say. And then I'll usually mount um, a, a flash with a diffuser on it or uh, I'll use this arm flash. Um, and the arm flash, I can kind of, I can, what I, what I can do with that is I can bend those, these crazy arms right here. I, I can bend those around my lens and then um, have the light coming either from the left or the right or from the top or from the bottom. Um, whereas with the on-camera flash, I'm just getting the light coming from the direction of my camera, which sometimes can, can be a little flat. Uh, so I, I like both of those uh, flashes. There's definitely more you can do. Um, there's, I, I've seen setups and I've tried setups with multiple flashes and flash boxes and um, tripods. That's all a lot for me. Uh, when I'm hiking around, I don't like to have a lot of weight and I, I like a, a pretty simple setup. Uh, so the, you, you'll see there's no tripod on this list. I, I really like doing things handheld. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, again, smartphone, you can get good photos with a smartphone. It's, it's, not, it's not bad. Uh, and I, I've got a few pro tips at the end for uh, any smartphone photographers here. Let's see. So I have uh, just a series of photos of the same exact plant, but with those different cameras, just to give people an idea of how different a, uh, a subject can be, uh, depending on what camera you're using, what lens you have on that camera. And um, you know, these are, these are obviously looking uh, very different here. And one of the reasons they're different is, be, is due to this minimum focus distance. So all of those lenses and those different cameras that I just showed you, they all will um, have a different minimum focus distance. That is to say how close you can get with the lens of your camera to the subject uh, with it still being in focus. You know, obviously, if you've got your cell phone and you put it right up to somebody's eye about a centimeter away, it just it, it can't focus. The lens isn't meant to meant to do that. If you want to take that kind of photo, you're going to have to use a, a macro lens. Um, and the macro lenses are designed to get you really, really close to the photos and still be able to focus. Um, and, uh, you know, you can you can judge for yourself here, um, you know, which which photos are more appealing. Um, I will note, uh, I, I did this iPhone 8 with a macro clip. So you can get these macro clips for your, your phone. Um, I'm not a huge fan of them. Uh, I don't really have good luck with them. Um, I'd rather use that Olympus TG Tough camera. Um, but you know they are, uh, they are an option. If again, you're just an iPhone user and you wanna get a little bit closer, they do have those uh, macro clips that you can clip onto your camera or clip onto your phone and get a little bit closer um, with those. Uh, so moving on um, to the meat of this talk, um, I will touch those things. We'll touch composition, light, background, all that stuff. Um, and, and first, uh, I do want to go over composition. And uh, simply put, composition is how the elements of a photo are arranged. And so you can see the photo on the left here. Uh, it, th this is the same scene, uh, right? I'm standing in the same spot. My two flowers, those are the exact uh, same two flowers. Um, but the photo on the left, I've just kind of taken a snapshot um, without really thinking much about it. And then the photo on the right, I think maybe this was the photo that uh, uh, Orchid was alluding to of the, the Romnia. Uh, the photo on the right, I, I really thought about the composition here. Um, and it's not that actually I wasn't uh, thinking about composition in the photo on the left. Uh, I was just actually on a ridge and it was uh, like 30 mile per hour winds. And I, I ended up taking about a hundred different photos of this scene, try, just hoping that I can get the flowers in the right um, composition that, that I wanted. Um, it was more or less just trying to get lucky um, because the wind was going so hard. Um, but obviously the, the one on the right is a much more appealing photo. Um, and that's true for a number of reasons. Um, you know, one is the, the subject is clear. Um, the subject is kind of nicely placed in, in the frame. Um, and there's balance to the photo too. So 
this, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of got this area right here um, taken up by this flower. And then the other side of the frame is balanced by this slightly out of focus flower here. Um, the other thing to note is if you kind of squint your eyes a little bit, um, you'll notice that the negative space in this photo that's created by the flowers is just, it, it kind of uh, almost creates this like interesting uh, shape. Um, and that, that's a compositional element also. If I were to do that in this photo over here on the left, it would just not really look like anything. Um, the other thing to know is um, I, these, these flowers aren't overlapping and that's intentional. Um, if I were to overlap those flowers, it, it would change the composition entirely. So just le leaving a little bit of uh, space in there is, um, you know, can, can make a, a big difference. I have a bunch of different photos of the scene where they're slightly overlapping again because the wind was going and um, this, was the, this was the one that, uh, that I was going for. Um, and, you know, also know this is at sunset. So again, um, you know, I've got that kind of nice, uh, nice light across the, the landscape. Uh, and I, as I was going through my photos, I kind of realized that I do this thing uh, that I didn't realize I do all the time, but I, I generally will include one uh, flower in focus uh, in my frame, and then I will have another flower out of focus. You saw that with the last photo. I think this is just something, I, I don't know why I do it. I guess I just, I tend to do it. Um, the, the composition, I suppose, appeals to me. Um, and, um, you know, it is, it is something that, I'm th that I think about. So, you know, if anything, next time you go out and you take a, a photo of a flower, just pay attention to where it is in the frame. Um, you know, uh, there's a couple of rules that you can use to uh, to place your your flower, there's the rule of thirds. Uh, so obviously here on the left, I've um, divided the frame into thirds, and uh, under the rule of thirds, you're supposed to place your subjects um, on one of these third lines, um, or you know in the corners. It's, that's that's supposed to be the best place uh, to put your subject. Um, and you can follow that rule. It's a good rule. Um, there's also this rule of prime numbers, or actually, that's a typo. Should be rule of odd numbers. I guess most of the beginning, yeah, rule of odd numbers. Um, so numbers one, three, five, seven. Um, it's it's better to have those uh, either a single subject or um, groups in threes or or fives or sevens um, in your photo. I don't if. Anything beyond seven just seems a little messy, uh, unless you're talking about the Last Supper or something, um, which by the way, 13 uh, in the Last Supper, so follows the rule. Um, so I'm kind of breaking the rule here. And in this photo, I'm breaking both rules. I'm not really on the third, and I have two subjects in my photo. Um, although really, I have one subject, and then what I, what, I consider, what I consider this to be is I consider that to be balance. You know, I place my subject on one side of the frame, and I'm trying to balance out the frame by putting the subject over here. This one sits a little low, this one sits a little high. Same thing over here. Um, this one's sitting a little bit low um, and on one side of the frame. And so I place that one on the other side. Uh, more composition. Um, so again, uh, rule of thirds here. This time I kind of did follow uh, the rule. And um, this is a, a good example of background also in subject isolation, um, which we'll get to. Uh, but then this uh, photo on the right here, I really like this photo, but it's not really compositionally sound. Um, even though, again, I do really like it. It kind of reminds me of fireworks or something. I think that's why I like it. But, you know, just a few things to point out, if I can be a self-critic, is yeah, there's this, you know, my edge is not clean. So you, you want to have a clean frame when you're uh, getting flower photos. This, to me, is really distracting down here. Yeah, you know, I, I can actually go into Photoshop and just clone that out pretty easily. But it's best to get it right in camera. Um, and I, I didn't do that, but, you know, if I was paying more attention uh, in the moment, I think I would have done that. Um, and then, you know, these flowers are kind of not really placed in, uh, you know, in any kind of balanced way. They're kind of awkward to me. Uh, but again, it kind of reminds me of fireworks, especially with this Indian rice grass in the background kind of out of focus. Um, so I like it. I, you know, I don't know. Take it. Uh, take it or leave it, I guess. <laughs> it's uh, just uh, one, of, one of those uh, I'm not sure photos. Moving on from composition. Um, so light is obviously important. Uh, light is probably the most important thing because uh, that's all really uh, photography is, right? Photo, uh, light. Uh, without light, you don't really have anything. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, you know, there's, there's a couple of different ways 
uh, to use light. I'm a big fan of natural light. Uh, for the, I, I don't really like getting out a bunch of flashes and um, my flashlights and setting up diffusers and all that. I, I like working with natural light, but sometimes it's, it's just uh, not an option at all. Uh, but you, you definitely want to pay attention to your light in the scene. So, um, you know, as the same, same thing with composition, you know, when you find the flower that you want to photograph, think about the composition. Also, also think about where the sun is in the sky. Is the sky, uh, is the sun behind your subject? Is it to the left of your subject? Is it behind you? And is it now, are you casting a shadow? Are you casting your own dumb shadow on the subject? I've seen that before. It's like a, a, a cool photo. And then you can like see the person's shadow with them holding their iPhone in front of their face and then the shadow. Um, think about where the sun is and then maybe move your body um, in relationship to the sun in order to get the light um, on the, on your subject where you want it. Uh, you know, I do, is, I, I mentioned I don't really like to use a flash, but sometimes you have to. So this is a, a Munza's Allium, and this was very late at night. The sun had already set, and I, I was looking for this plant. It took me a long time, uh, and I finally found it, but it was a bit late, and so I, I did have to use a, uh, a flash in this case. Um, and there is this, there's this uh, black background or dark background effect that's really popular with flower photographers. I'm honestly not a huge fan of it. I like backgrounds. I think they're important. I don't want to destroy them by um, the technique is to, to, in order to create this, what you do is you, you underexpose. So if you're using a camera, you're underexposing, um, you're, you know, turning your exposure down. So when you look through your viewfinder, it's almost black. And then you're using a flash to just light the subject. So you've essentially destroyed the background, created it black, but it, you know, makes the subject stand out nicely. Um, so you, you can do that with a flash. Uh, if, uh, if you need to, again, I'm not so much of a fan of it. Um, you know, as we get into background, uh, I think you'll, you'll understand why, uh, I don't like doing that. Um, the other thing to mention is there, this is true, whether you're using a, a phone or a camera, um, there are trade-offs, you know, light, uh, light is not, uh, infinite. You know, you don't get as much of it as you want. If you're going to, you know, the, the iPhone, uh, is now capable of taking, you know, photos and, a very low light, uh, but you're you're definitely trading off um, when you're photographing in low light, and and so if you are in low light, maybe you do want to use a flash so that you don't lose quality in another area. So when you uh, when you need light in your iPhone or in your camera, um, your your camera is uh, bumping up the ISO, the ISO, um, and with higher ISO, you get a lot more noise, you get a lot more grain in the photo. It's not as sharp, um, and then also um, a way to, to bring light into your photo is to have a wider aperture. Um, that is the, the window, the, the opening um, in the, the camera lens is uh, getting smaller or getting wider. The wider it gets, the more light it lets in, but also you're losing depth of field. So there's gonna be less in focus. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes you want less in focus, but um, it is a trade-off. So here I need as much light as possible. So I, I'm actually, it's called being wide open. I'm at f 2.8 on my camera. So I barely have anything in focus uh, in this photo. I, it kind of works. I like it, but um, I needed to do that because I didn't have any light. Uh, more, uh, more examples of light. So in, in this photo of this uh, blue dicks on the left here, um, again, this is sunset. It's natural light. Uh, what I've done here <clears throat> is I've allowed the sun to set um, just enough that my background is in the shadow. So that everything now against that background is going to stand out as being being very bright. Um, my light's coming from my left over here, um, and it's lighting up this little patch of blue dicks right here, exposed on this rock. Um, and I'm actually, and again, this is you know, this is I, I feel like I'm an artist or something. One of these moments. Um, I don't really know how I feel about photography like this, but I like doing it, and it's fun, and it's uh, you know, it's very creative. Um, but I, I'm actually in a stand of blue dicks with a 600 millimeter lens shooting through it. And the light is catching all the flowers that are in front of my lens, like right in front of my lens. And then it's lighting them up and it's, it's creating these what are called bokeh balls. Um, and then I, my subject is actually here shooting through it. Uh, but this wouldn't really work if my back, if my uh, hillside over here wasn't in the shadow, it, the bokeh balls wouldn't really stand out as much. Um, and again, you can really only create this effect when you've got like some nice side light coming in, lighting up the, the blue dicks flowers in this way. So actually every one of these balls is actually a, a blue dicks cluster. Um, over here, uh, this is a, another example of uh, a black background, but in this case, I didn't even use a flash. Kind of looks like an image that was flashed, but what I did is uh, 
Um, it's kind of funny, actually. I, I, there was a no trespassing sign where I was. And uh, so I picked up the no trespassing sign and I held it up um, in such a way that it was casting a shadow right behind my fairy lantern here. So what's creating all this dark back here is actually just a shadow. And I'm shooting this in just full sunlight. It's a, it's a blue sky day, no flash, but I've put a shadow behind my subject. So when I'm looking through my camera, um, this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing the subject with, um, with a shadow behind it. Um, and so there, there's little tricks that you can do like that in order to, to um, if, if you want, destroy your background. Now, I, I say destroy, I, I don't mean that. In a neg I, I mean destroy and neutrally. Um, but that, that is what you're doing is you're, you're destroying the background. Um, and speaking of background, uh, this is a, uh, a good example of why background matters. And background is actually my, my favorite thing. Uh, I, I mentioned at the front end, if you don't pay attention to anything else, pay attention to your background. Uh, the subject could, could really not even matter that much if, if the background is, is not solid. So this is the, uh, the endangered Santa Ana River woolly star. And I've, I've used that um, Olympus camera to uh, that little red point and shoot camera to get a photo uh, here. Uh, the one on the left, you can see, I just took the photo um, as is, uh, you know, as I saw it. And then I, you know, I was like, oh, I don't really like the brown. You know, most of the time, especially in Southern California, when you're taking a photo of a plant, it, you're always getting brown in the background. Um, just cause you know, our hills are green for like two and a half months out of the year. And the rest of the time you're just getting these bra, these uh, brown or straw colored backgrounds, or sometimes they're gray. Uh, they're not great looking. And so one of the ways that you can avoid doing that is you can, you can pluck this endangered uh, woolly star plant and then you can hold it up to the sky. Just kidding. You don't never pluck them. What I've done here is I've, I've actually just lowered my body by about a foot and then put the subject up against the sky. I didn't actually pluck this flower. Um, that was a joke, guys. Uh, but also, you'll know in this, this picture on the right, um, I've eliminated kind of this distraction over here, these, um, I, guess, I suppose they're bracks. <laughs> Arlie, somebody, uh, somebody knows what those are called, but uh, I've, I've taken those out of this photo over here. And, um, and it, it, it creates a much more um, clean image, um, just a nice, smooth blue background in the back. Um, blue is just a much more appealing color to the human eye than uh, kind of a, a, a dirty, uh, you know, grayish straw color over here. Um, I will note that uh, you're not, you're not going to want to use this, put it against the sky trick. If you have clouds or overcast skies, then you just have this blown out, um, blown out photo. And then when you're, when you're up against a really bright uh, white color, you get a lot of this like weird fringing around your edges, which isn't, isn't apparent on this photo because I don't have any. Um, but just note if, if it is overcast or, or if you have clouds in the sky, you don't want to put your flower up against um, the, the white uh, clouds. Um, so more on background and uh, the, the point here, I think, is to um, create a clean background. You can see there's just a lot of clutter. This lupin flower uh, on the, the left, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on here. It's very busy. Um, I haven't isolated my subject. It's kind of in focus. Uh, and then the background is also partially in focus. And there's also these like this, there's some grass right here. There's some grass right here that's distracting. Um, that doesn't have to do with the background, but it's just something that um, if I were to take this photo again, I, I'll usually clean up my, my, uh, my frame a little bit. I'll pull out all the little brown grasses and, 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 and clean it up nice. You know, if there's a Mountain Dew can behind it. I'll usually take that out of the frame. So I do, I do a little bit of cleaning up, um, but this is a good example of a, a, just a bad, busy background. Um, as opposed to this photo over here, um, it's just, it's, you know, it's very clean. It's not distracting. The subject is, is nicely isolated. And um, again, you can, there's various ways to create this, uh, this, this background. Um, one of them is to use a, a low, um, aperture. So having your aperture wide open, um, creating that shallow depth of field, that is a way to destroy your background. Also using really long lenses. Um, so I, I like to shoot with this 600 millimeter point and shoot super zoom Sony camera that I have. I always go to 600 and I'm standing about three feet away from my flower. And it usually just uh, totally obliterates the background um, just because I'm shooting it at such a, a long range. Um, another trick you can do is to just put something I think I've got a couple of photos coming up here, but you can just put something behind there um, uh, in order to 
to cut out all the, all the background if you wanted to. Um, so more on background. So this uh, Linanthus photo on the left, what I've done is I've, you know, there, there were some poppies blooming in the same area. And uh, what I did is I just positioned my body. I, I moved around, I'm on my belly laying down, um, not smashing any other flowers, of course. Uh, but I, I'm just positioning myself and my camera in such a way that I put the poppy that's behind this plant directly behind it as it sits in my frame of my camera. Um, and that way, you know, I, I get the subject isolation and the poppy is far enough away and I'm using a low enough aperture that it's, it's nice. You, you know, you can't tell it's a poppy. It's just this bright color, you know, for all, for all you guys know, it's a, you know, piece of taffy or something. Uh, but this is a this is a way to kind of create uh, create a colorful image and then um, get a, a really kind of clean um, and interesting uh, background. Um, and then again, as opposed to this uh, Calanthus over here, um, very cluttered background. Again, the subject isn't really isolated. Your eye doesn't really land on anything in particular. And then something that I'm also very very conscious of is overlap. Um, my my main flower and focus is right here. Also, the, this flower on the edge in the corner is in focus. That shouldn't be the case. You don't want to draw the, the viewer's eye to the corner. Um, but overlapping subjects is uh, definitely something to pay attention to. Um, and I, I alluded to this a bit earlier. Sometimes you, want, you don't want to destroy the background. I actually love keeping the background in my photos for context. Um, that's the case here in this the rhododendron photo. Um, you know, this, this plant is endemic to the redwood forest. and I wanted to reflect that in the photo. And so I, I kept the, the redwood forest uh, more or less in focus. I, I changed my f-stop just enough that it was, that I created a little bit of subject isolation, but you can tell what's going on back there. Um, same thing with this uh, super rare mariposa lily. It's growing right on the beach bluffs in Big Sur. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to reflect the fact that the ocean and this headland is back here. Um, so I used a wide angle macro lens and I, I kept the background, um, you know, semi, uh, semi-visible. Um, again, here with this Sierra Columbine, I could have just zoomed in and just gotten a photo of the Columbine, but I think it's it's pretty neat to show that there's this alpine lake in the background and that the, the Columbine is growing on these you know rocky outcroppings above the lake. So um, I'm a huge fan of, of uh, including background, not destroying it. It's one of the reasons I'm not a, a big um, flash guy is, is the, the flash usually um, uh, messes the background up. Uh, so I keep, I keep using this word aperture and that's related to depth of field. And I don't, I definitely don't wanna go into aperture and ISO and shutter speed and like all the complications of using cameras, but um, just to demonstrate what you can do if on an iPhone, you can't really change this. I think you can actually download an app where maybe you could like a camera app. Um, but this is an example of how you can, um, you know, make your background more or less apparent just by changing your aperture. So. I'm at 2.8 here, I'm at F14 here. Um, and this is the same exact scene, but like the, you know, the background is starting to come into focus and there's obviously a lot, a lot more of the flower in focus. Um, more on background. So this is just a subtle touch. I kind of, I really like the way the scale bud looked, but it's, you know, something was kind of missing. And so, you know, I wanted to include a little bit of what you're probably assuming is the sky in this, uh, in this photo. And you're like, Aaron, what do you mean that's not the sky? Um, and uh, I, I've got a, a behind the scenes of this photo. Um, <laughs> this is kind of funny, uh, but I've actually just uh, had a Quaker Oats uh, granola bar uh, in my backpack and just uh, put it on the ground. Again, you can see with, oh, sorry. Um, in this photo, I've, uh, I'm using my Olympus camera and it's right on the ground. Again, I'm, I'm always getting myself right on the ground to get at level with uh, my subject. Um, and I've, I've kind of faked the sky here with the with a, uh, an artificial color. So the moral of that slide, I think, is to carry a, a Quaker Oats granola bar with you wherever you go, or at least some bright colored, sky colored, uh, something or other. So um, I'm, I'm speeding up a little bit, uh, apologies, uh, but I'm, I'm gonna kind of fly through the last few slides here. Um, so interest uh, is definitely something that you want to include. Uh, in your photos, I, I like to say, add interest, remove distraction. So anything that's distracting, like those bright little pieces of grass that are catching light or, you know, a stem that's, that's coming up, I try and remove that. I'm either like plucking that out physically in the field, or I'm trying to just position my body in such a way that it's not in my frame. 
Um, but insects, uh, especially on flowers, are great ways to uh, draw the eye in and create some interest in the, the photo. Um, you'll also note here, I'm always, I'm, I'm getting at the level of, of the subject. So both of these shots, I'm at eye level with this bee. Um, and with this link spider, I'm actually a little bit below it. And that's, um, that's an important, you know, it's, it, you're going to get a way different image if you're standing atop, you know, uh, and, and looking down on these, um, these things that are happening on the statura here. Um, if, if you're standing above it versus getting down at, at eye level. Uh, but always include insects if you can. Um, they, they do provide great interest. Um, the moral of that slide, I guess, is hang around Detura and you'll, you'll see interesting things happening. Um, same thing here. Uh, this blister beetle, it just, it's, it's like an anchor in the photo. It really just settles the eye and um, it makes it nice and clean. Um, and then again, I'm breaking, you know, I'll just point out, I'm breaking my own rule here. There's no rule of thirds going on here. Um, I've placed the blister beetle in the middle of the frame, but, uh, you know, I like it. So deal with it. Um, and then on here, uh, I'm definitely not one of these, uh, I call them spray bottlers. They're photographers that carry a water spray bottle and like every photo has to have some dew, some fake dew or, you know, some fake droplets on them. That's definitely not me. Um, but I did go out after a rainstorm and um, caught these little droplets, um, these little orbs of water forming on the anthers of this. Uh, this is just your common buckwheat, Ariognum californicum, or excuse me, Ariognum fasciculatum, California buckwheat. Um, uh, but it, uh, you know, it made for an, an interesting uh, photo to have those droplets there. Um, scale is a, another thing to pay attention to. I'll just uh, mention it real quick, but uh, you know, there's, there's a decision to be made when you come across the flower that you want to photograph. Uh, and that, that decision is, or that uh, the dilemma is, uh, you know, what scale are you going to photograph it? Are you going to get your macro lens on your camera and narrow in on the, um, the anthers here? Or, you know, in this case, you can almost see the yellow pollen of this bush mallow. Um, it's out of focus, so you can't quite see it. But, um, you know, are you going to get really close in or do you want to just like photograph the plant as a whole, as is the case in this chocolate lily? Or do you even want to take a step back further and get the whole scene? Um, sometimes you can do all of those things, um, but, you know, time is is limited. Yeah, you can't you can't sit around at a scene all day and just photo. Well, I guess you could. You can do whatever you want. Um, but they're, uh, they're, I'm usually trying to make a decision. I'm, I'm trying to find what's interesting about the plant. Um, you know, in this case, I found the way that all the um, the stamen uh, are, are kind of bunched together, as is the case with a lot of mallows. I found that to be really interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, if, if you're in Joshua Tree and you've got a bloom like this, you got to take a step back and, uh, and, and capture that. So uh, moving on, uh, I, I think what I wanted to do is just kind of go through really quickly my uh, thought process for um, photographing something. So this is, this is all the same plant. Um, and I've got frames one to six here. And uh, I, I came across this. This is, again, one of the few things that's blooming at this time. This is Cliff Aster, Malacothrix saxatilis. Um, so it's a pretty ugly shrub. Uh, at, at first glance, you know, it's just it's, it's been chewed by a bunch of deer. Um, it's kind of beaten down, probably been ran over by a car a couple of times, mountain bikers, um, really beat up. Uh, but I, I narrowed in on the, the flowers over here, which are actually quite pretty. They've got this nice red underside. And then I was thinking about, okay, what kind of composition do I want? I don't really like it from above. Let me get down on the side and let me see. Um, and th these are all taken with my iPhone. Um, you know, at this point, I switched over to my camera. I, I had my composition. I kind of found what I wanted to photograph. Um, and I, at this point, I'm trying to pull all those things we talked about together, you know, light, composition, background, et cetera. And, um, and so, you know, I've, I've got my composition here, but the background is very busy. You can't really eliminate the background, you know, with an iPhone in the same way that you, you can with a camera. So I got my full frame camera out with my lens and started taking photos of this flower. And, um, you know, I like this, this uh, number four here. I liked it, but the background again, is kind of like reddish and um, I didn't really like the color of it. And, uh, and so I took a, actually a, a big old leaf and then I'm just holding it behind the flower as I'm photograph. I'm holding it behind with my offhand as I'm photographing it with my right hand. Um, and this is just in full sunlight, no flash or anything. Um, and I'm holding the leaf in such a way that the leaf is actually facing away from the sun so that what I have is I have a green leaf, but the, what you're looking at in the back here that's dark green, that's the shadow of the leaf. So it's, 
it's not bright. If I were to have the leaf facing the sun, it would be much brighter and my subject wasn't, wouldn't stand out as much. So I'm holding the leaf in such a way that the sun is behind it. So um, I've got a, a, a green shadow behind my subject. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I'm at here, except there's like, I, I just didn't like this line here and I didn't like how there was this split in the background. So I, I kind of changed it a little bit. I, I was looking at the back of my camera and I thought, oh no, I don't really like that. Um, and I didn't like how the, this out of focus flower was off of the frame. And so uh, I just changed that. And, you know, I, I didn't really talk about this, but always review your, your photos. You know, after you take them, um, look at your camera, look at the back of the screen or look at your phone and make sure that you got what you wanted. And if you didn't, well, you're still right there and you can just change the thing you don't like and, and then get the, the shot that you do like. So this last uh, shot I like, uh, you know, I've removed kind of that line um, I like the background a lot more. And then I kind of like how this, uh, in the background, this line changes because there's not really a lot going on in this upper right-hand corner. Um, so I like the line there more than, than down here in the other shot. So that's just kind of my thought process when I'm taking photos. And I usually take quite a lot of photos and it, always the last, the final one is the one that I like. Um, so I, uh, I'll just take a quick, um, I'm a little bit over my time here, but I think that's all right. I'll take, uh, I'm just gonna take a few minutes to uh, go over um, tips for uh, identification purposes. So we've talked about kind of how, how to take aesthetically appealing photos. Um, these are just a couple of quick pro tips for um, taking photos if you uh, wanna upload to a site like iNaturalist or CalFlora, um, just good reference photos. Uh, and there's a couple of things that, you want to pay attention to. Um, you want to nail a focus, of course. Uh, it's harder to do with an iPhone than, than you might think. Um, pay attention to all the things we've already talked about. Background scale, get several image, uh, images, and then you want to capture characteristics also. Um, so my iPhone, um, and I'm sure other smartphones, uh, whatever you have, they, they're they horrible at focusing. Um, you know, they're, they're called smartphones, but they're just, they're they're not capable of recognizing that the thing I'm holding in my hand is the thing I want to be in focus. So um, a, a trick is to, what you can do on the iPhones is you can actually push the screen and hold it. And then AE, AF lock will come up and that's a, that's a focus lock. So you can manually focus on your iPhone. Um, don't just point it at the flower and just you know pray and, and hope you're gonna have it in focus. You can go ahead and um, and click the thing you want to have in focus, but you've got to put your finger on there for a while. You've got to hold your finger on it until you see um, autofocus lock. Um, and again, that, that minimum focus distance. So there's, there's going to be, in this case, I was probably too close to the actual flower, uh, this photo on the left, and my phone just wouldn't focus, but it liked my hand behind it. So you might have to move a little bit away from uh, your subject in order to get the iPhone to focus. Um, again, pay attention to your background um, when you're, you're taking reference photos, same as we talked about before. Um, I, these aren't great photos. I'm just, you know, I, you know, obviously this is some allium that I have in my backyard, uh, or actually it's a Mwilla. Um, But, you know, it's, it's a much cleaner uh, subject on a, a smooth background than it is in some weird, um, you know, complicated background, especially with highlights. Um, okay. um, try and capture scale as best as you can. Um, I always carry these little rulers, these little like a, got a pocket card. Um, it's like a credit card size measure that I carry with me. And I'll always put my plants on there because you never know when um, this, the scale is going to be important for identification. Um, and in fact, um, most of the time it is. Um, so it's good to get some kind of scale. If you don't have a ruler, you know, coins do, or sometimes just your hand is, is a good thing to, to throw in there. Or, you know, take your shoe off, hang your shoe on the uh, the plant, maybe put, put your sunglasses on it. I've done some goofy things where I like put my hat, my sunglasses on a plant to give it a face and also add some scale. Um, then you want to take uh, photos of as many characteristics as you can. Uh, in, in my case, you know, I, 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 I have, um, you know, some botanical experience and so I'll, I'll know, you know, what to look for in the Jepson keys. Um, when it, when it comes to plant identification, I'll try and get uh, photographs of that thing like these, um, Eriastrum up here, the corolla size, the corolla length is actually a really important characteristic to identifying the subspecies. So I definitely want to get a photo of the corolla length. This isn't the endangered uh, species. Uh, and I don't recommend um, people go out and pluck pieces of plants off, but 
um, you know, in this case, I, I have a, a permission from the landowner uh, to do the work and I have a, a permit also to uh, pull the, the parts of the plants off. Um, and then this photo down here, I call this the Ron Vanderhof. Um, this is a great, a great way to create reference photos, just uh, getting pieces. Again, uh, if you're just a normal person out there, perhaps you shouldn't be uh, ripping pieces off of plants and um, creating these specimens. But if you have a collecting permit or something else, you know, you're, you're welcome to do that. Um, but uh, Ron, if, if any of you know who he is, he, he is kind of infamous for this style of, um, of photo, which, which is actually really helpful. You know, you're showing the basil leaves, here's the calling leaves, and then um, here's a picture of the inflorescence, and this is a uh, Saltagilia splendens. Um, and that is, uh, that's the end of my presentation. I, I went a little bit over time. I don't know if we'll have much time for questions, um, but I, I did just want to uh, pitch <laughs> that Olympus camera. You know, if you're, if you just have an iPhone and you're thinking like you want to step it up a little bit, um, this is a great camera for getting up close to plants. And you can do some cool things with it too. As you, as you saw, I had some really, you know, nice, interesting photos that I took with this tiny little camera. Um, I don't work for Olympus. I'm not on a commission, but highly recommend it. Uh, it's, it's, it's great. And it only costs like $350, $400 if, uh, if uh, you've, you've got that in the bank. So I guess that'll be, uh, we can open it up to questions if we have time. I don't know if we do. I think Katie, I don't, I can't hear you. I'm not able to hear you. I'm sorry, I forgot to turn off on you. <laughs> I think by now I uh, know how to do that right. Anyway, um, so um, we do I do have one question for you, Aaron, um, and we have time for some few questions, but um, if anybody does want to ask a question, go ahead and put your question in the Q&A and we'll get Aaron to answer it. Um, Aaron, I just wanna say that was a really great presentation. Um, just a lot of great hints and things to um, things that I have, I'm not at all a photographer, but uh, what you gave us was some really great tips on how to, especially dealing with background, like you say, that's one that um, makes a huge difference. So um, Arlie has a question, which is, um, can you explain photo stacking with the Olympus Tough? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, and photo stacking, if, if people don't know what that is, um, this, this could have easily been like a five hour presentation if we wanted to go into all the photography nonsense. Um, but I, I'll actually do photo stacking with my regular, my full frame camera manually. And that's where you're, you usually wanna be on a tripod, uh, but you'll take maybe 10, um, up, you know, maybe, maybe up to a hundred in some cases more. Um, you'll, you'll take multiple images of the same subject at slightly different focus points. And then you, you wanna stack all those images together in Lightroom or some other photo editing software. And then you get um, kind of everything in focus. So again, the, the camera can't really focus on everything all at once. It's, it's limited in that sense. Um, and so that, that's a technique that you can do. That, uh, that Olympus camera that I uh, showed actually has in-camera focus stacking, which is really cool. So it has a microscope mode, so you can get really up close to the, to the um, subject. And then if you go, um, there's, uh, you'll have to find it in, in the camera, but you, all you do is you just change one setting. I think, Arlie, it's a, it's a picture of a ladybug, if I'm not mistaken, on the Olympus. You want to find the ladybug picture. Um, and it actually does in-camera photo, photo stacking. So you'll just hold it up to your subject and then hit your shutter button, and it'll go, and it'll take maybe 10 photos of that, that subject. And the camera itself will focus at different, um, focus on different areas, and then it'll stack all those together in camera, and then it'll get you that. Um, like if I go back here, it'll give you, um, you know, this, this, uh, in just with it's just a single photo, it was only able to focus on kind of this front part, but with the photo stacking, it was able to get everything in focus. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's just, all you have to do is just go to the one setting and then it does everything automatically. It's, you know, any, anybody can use it. Okay, great. Um, I have a question from Steph. Um, she asks, would you recommend the Olympus Tough camera for taking only plant photos, or is it a good camera for everyday photos, including portraits? That's a good question. I, um, I think probably uh, 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 if you have a recent iPhone or a recent Android phone, it's probably 
you're probably going to get better portraits, especially with the, um, the, the software that's in the iPhone. You're going to get better portraits with an iPhone. Um, you're probably going to get better photos in general with an iPhone. Um, just because of the, the computer software that's in the iPhone, it's able to, to do artificial background blurring. Um, and it's able to do like artificial subject isolation. You can actually use portrait mode on your iPhone to get plant photos. It'll work. Um, sometimes you get these weird you know, like things that you didn't want to be in focus will be in focus. So it, it doesn't work all the time. Um, but I think that uh, I, I would recommend that Olympus camera. It, it's really, really good for macro. Um, it's kind of so-so for everything else. If, if you're, if you want to get a, a good portrait camera, um, if, if you want to get a camera and, and you want to do other things, I would probably just get like a, an APS-C digital camera and, a, and um, you know, a, a kit lens or, you know, you can, you can get uh, macro lenses that, that serve as portrait lenses. Also like a good uh, 50 millimeter or, you know, to hundred millimeter macro lens. Those are usually really, really good portrait lenses also. So if, if you're looking to do multiple things, I'd, I'd probably not go in the direction of the Olympus. It's, um, in, in my opinion, it's, it's kind of like a one trick uh, horse. It's the, the macro is really awesome, but I don't, I don't really use it for anything else. No, it's, it's got a small sensor, same sensor sizes in the iPhone, um, but it's, it's software is, is um, not nearly what's in an iPhone. Okay, thanks. Um, next question is from Ronald. Do you use HDR for landscape and sunset pictures? I, um, I used to, uh, or I, when HDR was kind of, uh, when HDR first hit the, sh hit the, uh, the scene, I, I tried it out. Um, I wasn't really a fan of it. Uh, what I do do, um, is, and I don't know, maybe this photo looks HDR. -y. I'm not sure. Um, I I'll shoot in raw. Um, and my, I have the Sony a7 III and it's, uh, raw is a, a way, so you can shoot in JPEG where your, your photo is, um, your camera just captures a, um, you know, a standard image and everything, you know, what you, what you have is, is, um, and that's all that you have. But when you capture a raw image, you're actually capturing a bunch of information, um, in addition to, you know, everything that was in the photo. So a raw image, you can throw it into a, a processing software like Lightroom, and you can recover your shadows and you re can recover your highlights. And you can get all this information that wasn't there. Um, so I don't really do HDR, but I, I do shoot in RAW. And um, you know I will make uh, adjustments in Lightroom. Um, and oftentimes, I'll open up my shadows a little bit. I'll get detail out of the shadows. And then I'll also pull my highlights down, and I'll, I'll get the highlights. So um, yeah, exposing a scene perfectly is for a long time has been um, a very difficult thing to do without doing um, multiple exposure. HDR is basically just combining multiple exposures. Um, and that's been a difficult thing to do, but with the capability of um, my camera, I just shoot in raw and I can, I can pretty much get my highlights and my shadows where I, where I want them to be. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. Um, one more question from an, an anonymous attendee. Have you played with portrait mode on the newer iPhones? Can it be used to get the flower better in focus? I uh, I have, yeah. I, I do a lot of experiments with the iPhone. Um, and I have uh, I have used portrait mode. So, uh, like I mentioned, sometimes it works on flowers. If you have a real simple subject um, and, and you want to isolate the background, because so what portrait mode does is it's, um, in the iPhone is you're taking a, a picture and then the, the iPhone is recognizing what you want to be in focus. And then it artificially blurs everything else. It's very different than the way a camera blur is. Um, a camera blur is optical. You know, the, the blur is a result of the, the lens and, and your aperture opening. Uh, but with the iPhone, it, it's totally artificial. Um, and so portrait mode is, is a way to get that really nice um, background blur. And it does work on plants. Um, but again, I've noticed I get a lot of weird, if you don't have the right scene, if the scene is too complex, you'll get like weird stems that are in focus. And it, it almost just looks like this, this um, like mashup of in focus and out of focus components. Um, sometimes it's really bad, but if, if you have a simple scene, um, yeah, I, I would actually recommend going to portrait mode on your phone and then, and then taking that flower photo and it's going to look a lot better. Um, than it would have otherwise, um, because the, the iPhone software is going to blur out the background. And, uh, and again, isolate your subject and, and kind of give you that 
that nicer looking uh, shot. But but yeah, it's not it's not perfect. I do know on the the newest uh, iPhone, I think it has selective focus where um, not selective focus, but um, it'll it'll when you take a photo, it'll actually capture every plane of the image in focus, and then you can go back and choose your focus after the fact. So it kind of just um, you know, photography is not even really a thing anymore. You just like choose choose where you want the focus to be afterward. Uh, but I, I do believe the newer iPhones um, can do that. I don't know how well it works. Um, I haven't I haven't played around with that. But uh, portrait mode can can be definitely effective in getting good uh, um, good uh, isolated subjects uh, on the uh, on the iPhone. Okay. Um, one more question from Ronald. Do you make prints, um, big ones? I, uh, I do. Yeah. Um, and I'm, you know, most of my photos are taken on a, a higher resolution camera. And so I'm, I'm able, that's, that's a, a good question. I, people are interested in printing, uh, photos that they have uh, and you're shooting on an iPhone, for example, um, you're not going to want to make a big print, uh, because the, the, the resolution is not there. So it's, it's not going to, it's absolutely not going to look the same as it, as it, um, would have looked on your phone. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll make uh, occasional prints. Yeah, I don't really do anything with them uh, aside from give them to people or just hang them up in my office or my house. Um, but yeah, I have a number, and they're usually landscapes. I don't have any macro prints that I've done, but I'll I'll, I'll print some landscape photos, um, some two by three, uh, two feet by three feet. Um, but I, I like a like a smaller size, like twelve by twenty is kind of uh, a nice size that, that I like. Okay. Um, I don't have any other questions. If there's anyone else that has questions, um, maybe you can reach out to Aaron um, via his email address, which he's posted here. Aaron, I just have a quick question. Where the location of the photo that you have on the screen now, please? Oh, that is in. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure, but it's the hill, the hills to the south of the property preserve in Lancaster like okay. the Elizabeth Lake area. Okay. Um, Ronald actually just popped up with, actually I just have a couple, well, one more question. Sure. Um, Ronald asked if you have a website with your photos, with your pictures. Um, no, I, I don't actually. I, um, so I, I, I gave the presentation uh, and I, I caveated it with, this is a way to take better photos, but I, um, you know, at some point I might, I might go the, the route of a website, but I'm still trying to grow as a photographer. And it uh, seems like a lot of the photos that I take one year, I, I think they're great. And then the next year I'm like, oh, this sucks. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's constant, constantly getting better. Um, so no, I, I don't have a website. I, I put some photos on Flickr, but it's a combination of flower photos um, and then uh, like rock climbing photos and just landscape photos. Um, so I, I do, I think you can type in my name, Aaron Eccles into, into Flickr and find my Flickr page, but that's really all I have. I don't have a, a place. I just hoard all my photos and don't show them to anybody except for uh, just now. Okay, um, Arlie says, thanks, Aaron. Great advice and amazing photos. We had a comment from others on just a great presentation. So thank you and appreciate your providing your email if folks wanna reach out to you. Um, before we finish up, I just want to uh, remind everybody we do have our online plant sale coming up. Um, the um, dates for that is October 5th and 8th is when the plant sale goes online for members. If you check our website or our Facebook page, you'll find more information and we will be sending out um, updated reminders um, to those folks who are on our email list. Um, so if you want to join our email list and you haven't done so already, you can do so by emailing, um, oh gosh, rsv at cnps.org. Is that right, Ed? Ah, sorry. Um, check our website. But anyway, um, keep your eyes out for the online plant sale coming up. Here's the info. There we go. Um, you can find the details by clicking on that uh, link. So um, with that, I guess, um, Orchid, do we have anything about our next presentation? 